Welcome to Art Beat, Canada's Art Pulse. I'm your host, Katie. In this episode, we bring you the story of Vlad Konic, an artist whose journey from the Adriatic shores of Croatia to the heart of Toronto is marked by the unexpected. In a time of global stillness, Vlad found views in the mundane, turning his favorite seaweed salad into mesmerizing, living sculptures that breathe, capture carbon, and produce oxygen. Join us as we trace his story of ingenuity, innovation, and the endless possibilities of reimagining the world around us. We are coming to you today from OCADU Live Studios. I have Vlad Konich. Thank you, Vlad, for being with us. And no worries. Hi. Hi. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a first in-person interview. Yeah. yeah. Very exciting. So, Vlad, you are a filmmaker, photographer, an artist who has won multiple international awards. You are known for your highly acclaimed living sculptures, which have been showcased at major exhibitions worldwide and have set a new standard in sustainable art. What sparked your interest in bio art? Oh, wow. <laughs> now <laughs> now when, it, when you say it, <laughs> it's been a lot. Well, it's a uh, kind of uh, a lot of coincidences had to happen for me to get into doing this. Uh, I moved to Toronto from Croatia. What I used to, what I say, like the best time in history. That was just a couple of months before the pandemic started. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, like 2019. I, I actually came to study interdisciplinary arts at Oka University. And then, you know, everything was shut down. Like we had online classes, uh, no access to studios, no access to materials, anything. But I had three boxes of algae seaweed salad in my fridge, which I used to eat because it's very tasty. <laughs> and then, you know, it was just like uh, the necessity. And I took the, the algae seaweed salad and I started to process it, experiment with it. And it took me a year to figure out how to make a first little tiny sculpture out of this. Of course, it crumbled and then it took four more years to uh, build bigger ones. Me working with a seaweed salad is not accidental. I come from Croatia. Uh, my roots are connected with the sea um, and with a particular island in the Adriatics. So sea is something that I'm uh, culturally tied to. My personal identity, the identity of my ancestors is uh, also involved. So, you know, working with algae was maybe just uh, me trying to recreate a piece of my home here in Toronto during the pandemic. So that's how the story started. And then everything just went nuts. I applied for an exhibition at the Abozo Gallery, mm -hmm. right? And at that point, I just had experiments. I didn't have a single piece of art done, mm -hmm. but the idea was great. And I applied with the video, interactive video installation that had some, incorporated some elements of the sea, but it was not bio art at that point. So. Along with the exhibition, I uh, presented a sketch of the future by art with a little description on the side wall, which was empty, but I just asked, can I use this wall too? And they were like, sure, it's empty. And then the gallery owner was, okay, this is really great, has a good potential. She was, she's also an avid environmentalist herself. Mm -hmm. And she said like, yeah, okay, like maybe we can arrange some sort of an e exhibition. And uh, then she asked me. Uh, how many pieces of art do you have finished? And I said, zero. <laughs> and she was like, oh, okay. But there was a lot of trust and investment on their behalf, right? Mm -hmm. So they invested into believing that I could produce something. And then it really went nuts because for the next three months, I was just producing, experimenting. I didn't know what I was doing, right? Wow. Because it was such a new area and you couldn't Google any solutions how to build sculptures from, you know, algae seaweed salad. <laughs> it's not in Google. But simultaneously, I also started a living algae farm uh, that was in my bathroom. So uh, the art studio was in my kitchen. So the whole apartment was like super. Algae galore. Algae galore. <laughs> yeah. So it was like a really happy period for me, although it was a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it was really great experimentation. How do you juggle the technical complexities with the conceptual goals of your creations? I'm really good at improvising. <laughs> Here's the thing. The thing is that trust, trust in the process. That's a mm -hmm. huge thing. So when I started doing the things with algae, I didn't know the thing is going to work. I didn't know that algae actually capture carbon, that they produce oxygen, that they will work in a gallery environment. I just had this like really strong vision and trust that it will work out eventually. Mm -hmm. It took three years, but it did. So that's, I put a lot of trust in the process and in, in the work 
and then what comes out of it you know sometimes it's brilliant on many occasions that people don't see there are like thousands and thousands of failures mm -hmm. that are built behind my art i felt so many times and i think it's really wrong i always say there should be a failure course at oka <laughs> uh, like that's just like normalize the failure yeah. you know we live in such a society that expects perfection beauty this and that all the time and then failing is seen as something that is not desirable and i would say we should fight against it because failure is the best thing when you fail by yourself for yourself and don't feel ashamed about it then there's a learning curve there and that's how i learned i failed so many times with this art oh my god <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had I had the sketch of this artwork on my wall for a year and I could not figure out how to make this from mm -hmm. algae, right? And it was such a torment, right? But it worked out fine. So yeah, trust in the process. And uh, I also, I'm well, I have been studying all of my life and uh, I've, I, I wouldn't call it a degree, but I, let's say a diploma in computer science mm -hmm. and a lot of other stuff that I've been doing. So computer science and science altogether came beneficial when it came to building the sculptures because there's also coding involved. There's like microchips that control the whole system. Right. So can I ask about the process? Sure, I can. I don't want you to give away any secrets or anything that you don't want to tell, but when I see your work, it is it bends my mind. It really does. And it's, A, it's stunning. It's beautiful in form and obviously what it represents, but how? <laughs> how do you do that? I do not know. <laughs> well, there's this thing that uh, I, I always come back to the to Michelangelo saying when he was working on his sculptures, he actually did not work on them. They were already present in the marble and he just br brushed off the odd parts, right? So I feel the same. It's a, I would describe my sculpture as gestural sculpture. It mostly gets born and it, appears by itself, but there's a deeper con conceptual thing. I tend to collaborate with algae, not just use it as a material. So let's say the, the sculpture starts at my algae farm. So what algae farm does, it uh, captures carbon from the atmosphere, but also from all the spectators that come visit my studio or all the spectators that are present at the exhibitions, right? And then the algae grows into this film, or I don't want to call it skin because it has it's, it's a loaded term nowadays. So let's say it grows into this film and it needs to be scooped, otherwise the algae culture dies. So there's this kind of uh, uh, relationships of care in between me and the algae. I scoop them, they live, they produce oxygen, I live, right? And then this film starts as like a large wet piece of, you know, gelatinous, really creepy wet <laughs> thing, right? And then I had to build a special air dryer to dry this thing. So the, I think the best thing happens when the thing starts to dry. There are millions of physical forces that act on it. And I do not interfere with the process that much. When it dries, it kind of goes where it wants to go. So it mimics growth. And I just help it out a little bit. So the more I control the process, the more uh, crappier results I get, right? Yeah, right? So it's like this thing already pre-exists, like in Michelangelo's thing, and I just help it get to its form and shape. And that's maybe 5% of my work. 95% of my work is going to the stores, acquiring materials, uh, engineering of uh, uh, waterproof plants, waterproof that, and then coding and stuff. So that's basically it. And then when I'm finished with producing this uh, sculptural, uh, let's say, body or object that is made from the algae dried film, then I suspended over a living algae culture. So you have both things at the exhibition. You have living algae that absorb spectators' breaths, and then it's kind of an archive of the breaths and the this ephemeral moments, right? Because when you think, let's let's switch to the breath a little bit. Breath a little bit. Breath is so loaded with stuff that you don't know what it's loaded with, right? Breath is, you know, breath is the start of storytelling. Breath is uh, what uh, music. It's rhythm. It's life. Carbon dioxide. It has oxygen. It has so much information. I mean, like uh, during the pandemic, breath couldn't even kill you, right? Because it was loaded with viruses. And there's so much thing there. So it's kind of informational projection of what we are doing right now, but you don't see it. Let's let's pretend for a second this room is like really cold. So you could see our breaths projecting. So what my sculpture does, it's something in between all these breaths, like this negative weird space. I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm curious 
where does the coding piece come into all of this? The engineering part. Okay, so I'm trying to hide all the technology because uh, okay, I don't want. Why? Yeah. Is why? Okay. Even in some in some exhibitions where I can do it, I'm trying to hide any sources that the uh, pieces are plugged into electricity or anything, mm -hmm. right? So they're just these mm -hmm. organic pieces that exist mm -hmm. by themselves. Because when you start to reveal technology or explain technology, then it loses this awe and magic, and yeah. it loses this little spiritual uh, dimension that it has, right? But if you were to open the piece, there would be like a lot of wires there and a lot of that. There are microchips that control the, uh, there's a cardiovascular system that travels through the body of the top sculpture and it brings the living algae to do the thing. And you can see little bubbles of air going, it's like animation of the sculpture makes it feel like it's more alive. And uh, yeah, so, and then you have microchips that control the pumps that pump the outside air through the algae liquid, so algae can eat carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. Bigger sculpture has multiple microchips. You can actually control this with your phone. And inside each sculpture, there are LED lights that are also, uh, that have conceptual value because they provide light to the algae for photosynthetic processes mm -hmm. so it can grow, right? And sometimes I need to tune the LEDs hue in some certain way and then I'm using a phone app to troubleshoot which hue fits the better which material because material really gets activated uh, when there's a background lighting. Without background lighting it looks black and it looks pretty much that like you're giving it a soul and a light. There are a lot of spiritual connotations here. Although I'm not a religious person there is a, you know like some sort of creating life things, mm -hmm. sculptural weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said I'm good at improvising. <laughs> Can you share some key techniques that you use in bio art and how they help express your ideas? Well, I would say breeding is definitely the most important uh, idea. Uh, that's like actually working on uh, my thesis is going to be all about breeding mm -hmm. and how breeding introduces the aesthetics of hope in the art. So I think the most important outcome and ideology of my art practice would be hope mm -hmm. uh, that inspires uh, building of communities and that inspires social action uh, because we live in really precarious times mm -hmm. uh, or climate anxiety and uh, climate crisis prompts all sorts of new problems that we are not anticipating and uh, we need some sort of change and the best way to change stuff is to activate uh, the social sphere right so i'm trying to build my artwork in a way when you enter a space it's a space of attunement to non-living organisms to the nature as we call it and then through this collaboration artwork through its aesthetics and through its beauty inspires feelings of awe and psychologically, you should know because you're like it's like major, like super professional. Sure, tell everybody. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the, the awe inspires environmental thinking and inspires more community building. So this is what I'm aiming for. Uh, plus, algae produce fresh oxygen on the site, which fires up spectators' neurons in some sort of way that they are feel more liberated to think about the problems uh, that they want to solve. And that they can see a change happening right in front of them because sometimes the algae double in size throughout the exhibition, right? So you breathe out carbon dioxide and it gets captured in the site and you feel like, oh my God, I'm finally contributing to something. Because climate change is such a huge problem. Mm -hmm. It's like what we call a hyper object and you can't really comprehend how big it is, right? So yeah. I started to work with this approach of scaling down things and then people can really understand and participate. And like small piece by small piece, the whole thing is actually solvable. Mm. And I think uh, I'm not imposing anything to people. I'm not telling them you should do this to solve this problem. You should recycle or you should do that. No, they come to this space. They feel this connection and attunement with the art and the non-living uh, organisms. And then they start to think. And when they start to open up, I think this is the most beautiful thing ever. I had this exhibition at the Artist Project last year, and people would just come, and I said, I would say, this is a safe space for you, okay? There are no social constructs here. We want them all dissolved and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you're free to do whatever you want in this space. And then people just start to talk about things that what matter to them, right? Like, okay, so air is polluted in my neighborhood. It has been polluted for decades, but that's, you know, just the way uh, it played for us. And then, you know, they also 
started talking about social justice and climate justice, which are both connected with climate change. As indigenous communities and BIPOC communities are feeling the worst of climate change. Historically, they have been placed next to the power plants. So, you know, all this stuff. And oof, there is so much things here that uh, mm -hmm. and people just like bit by bit, they open up, right? And then suddenly the solution for the climate crisis and social crisis comes from within, mm -hmm. which is much better approach than when, you know, uh, I don't know who 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 said that uh, this uh, CEO of some like uh, major oil company said like you are responsible for this you should recycle more paper straws yeah the paper <laughs> straws yeah don't you carbon just, footprint don't you just <laughs> love when somebody tells you especially in Toronto when you know we have this like super high rents and living is just launching it and then they tell you you're responsible you should use less <laughs> coffee cups in your life. Plastic and, bags. Yeah. And then we have these major oil companies that are cashing in billions and billions of dollars. And oh gosh, so three algae CV salads cost me like six bucks. So I figured <laughs> out some sort of solution for six bucks. Can, can you please give me like 4.5 <laughs> billion dollars? I, I can figure out some more stuff. Right? You're so, the man. <laughs> yeah. Okay, without self-glorifying, I wanted to say that change is possible. Those companies could invest millions of dollars into change, but they just don't want to because keeping the status quo is uh, just desirable because, you know, you buy more products. Exactly. Right. Capitalism. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> Let's let's spend three more hours <laughs> on this topic. So I'm interested in hearing more about why you think it is that when you have your sculptures in these community spaces, like what do you think it is that draws people in and, as you said, opens them up? Okay, so first, abstract art. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody can put themselves into it because the sculptures are really abstract. And they can put their own emotions into that. Like that's the the most valuable aspect of abstract art in general. I feel like when I see a photograph, you consume this information really fast. But abstract art allows you to think about things. They, it opens up intuition, maybe. Mm -hmm. So people are drawn to the abstract art, like just when they see it, because they are curious about what this is. And once the curiosity is, starts to work, then they are really interested in learning more about that. So I think maybe the abstraction also, somebody told me once, this is like, this looks like stranger thing. You, know, you should have this own set. <laughs> They're not wrong. <laughs> they are not wrong. But then again, sci-fi and things that are strange, uh, they just spark curiosity mm -hmm. again. And curiosity is just like, what is this? And then that's what brings people into the room. And then when they start to learn about this, uh, you know, carbon capture thing, they're like, ooh, this is great. So I guess people just like something that they have not seen before. I don't. I also don't want to underappreciate two things, which which also plays into the aesthetics of hope, which is the light that comes mm -hmm. from within the sculptures. They're usually exhibited in darker spaces. It creates some sort of mood and atmosphere, and we are drawn to light, right? I think evolutionary too. And then there's this super, okay, I almost said supernatural color of the algae, <laughs> because we're so prone to being detached from nature that yeah. green is supernatural. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so the, the the vivid, extremely green color of chlorophyll and algae, I think that's what connects people to the sculpture because this green is just so relaxing. Mm. You know, it's contrast to everything and then yet is alive. And uh, also bubbles. Did I mention bubbles? <laughs> <laughs> you can see bubbles of this of breaths that are being processed in real time. So, yeah, so each sculpture has different uh, different sound as well. So there's this atmosphere that you want to step into. And then people want to just spend some time there talking mm -hmm. and uh, communicating and with other people as well. And you mentioned hope earlier. In dealing with climate issues, how important is it to instill hope through art? Well, I think hope is the essence of climate action whatsoever. So here's the, oh, that's such a long story. I, I'm not sure I want to talk about it. So I moved from Croatia and I'm actually a war survivor. I spent five years in bomb shelters in Croatia throughout my childhood. And I've seen the worst and the best of the humanity. But there was this always this one thing. It was the notion of hope that gets you through. So what happened after the war finished in Croatia was victorious. If there is a such thing of people who are victorious in war because it's bullshit 
mm-hmm. all over the place. And then I noticed the war got re-traumatized through the art as an aesthetics, through the news and political propaganda. That built this whole terrible generational trauma, which led to this really corruption of the society. And it's just still lingering on, you know, it's been like 20, 30 years, whatever. And mm-hmm. it's still there is a major thing, right? For sure. And the, that leads to some sort of nationwide apathy and depression. And then we have hope as opposed to that. So instilling a feeling of hope does the opposite, right? Mm-hmm. So what I'm trying to do with my sculpture is not to re-traumatize people. So you can approach environmental issues in two ways, basically. You can throw trash into galleries and you can throw soup on artworks or uh, you mm-hmm. can try to demonstrate the shocking things. Yes, okay, but these are not 1990s anymore. This thing doesn't work because we're so immersed in our phones. We are immersed in this shock do- doctrine all over us. Like you open up your phone and this is like... I don't go to Twitter anymore because, like, first five comments freak the shit out of me. Yeah. Or freak the pee out of me. <laughs> so, it, it, and that's what people do not want anymore. So I think the function of art galleries and museums and art in general is about to change and needs to change from this shocking, cold, intellectual pieces, blah, 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 to something that really inspires hope. Otherwise, why are you creating art for? You're creating it for a maybe a, a sorted amount of people and it mm-hmm. be, starts to become a privilege right and i'm trying to make our, my art accessible to everybody and uh, for everybody to feel the hope because that's dealing with social change in some sort of way listen i didn't want to when i started doing this i just wanted to make something intuitively i didn't think i'm just going to be a climate activist at mm-hmm. one point but i think my practice is going <laughs> that way <laughs> right so I think that is important, and uh, I think we're on a brink of change, what art is. And there are some people that are realizing that uh, uh, there are other ways to tell a story than just retell the whole story. And I keep on saying that we need to change the way the stories are being told, not mm-hmm. just to change the story, you know, mm-hmm. to change the general narrative. And then, like, what are the beneficials of the aesthetics of hope? You have people who are actually working and wanting to work on a change, and they are willing to resist climate anxiety and understand Mm -hmm. it. And that kind of brings us to being opposed to the system that is keep on oppressing us, right? And that at this point starts to be political, starts to be a little bit dangerous. (laughs) If I disappear in a couple of months, (laughs) just remember this (laughs) conversation. (laughs) Uh, I know some people who can find you, don't worry. <laughs> cool. <laughs> what kind of emotions are you aiming to stir in your audience through your art? Oof, uh, oh, what are the emotions related to hope? I, I would say emotions of uh, relief, mm-hmm. emotions of being energized, uh, emotions that everything is possible. So there's curiosity, creativity, safe space. Uh, I mean, sci-fi historically provides safe space for all sorts of issues. If you look at this first feminist issues in the 50s and 60s, right. they were written in sci-fi stories like this androgynous society, right? And it's like a really good safe space of telling anti-establishment ideas. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe, yeah, just activating and building communities again. And not particularly that I want people, I want just, I would love for people to be themselves Mm -hmm. it's really hard to be yourself nowadays right so coming back to who you are and rethinking a connection with nature again under quotation marks with non-living organisms and how this is something that has been taken away from us but it's so it's really close if you think of it i call this methodology of breeding with care Mm. right so uh, i recently talked at the Democracy Exchange Summit uh, in the Emerging Leaders Panels. So I asked people first to take, I asked the audience to take a breath, right? So mm-hmm. you're just like, can you please settle down? Let's take a breath. Let's take a breath now. Okay. Can we do it? Yeah. On a count of three. So one, two, three. So this is kind of cool because you're centered and you're mm-hmm. uh, attuning yourself individually to yourself, but uh, I I don't feel this is enough. So what I told the audience, can you now take another breath? But before you take that breath, uh, can you think about people who are in the room with you who are also going to take the 
the a breath as well and your breaths are going to intersect mm. they're going to be connected in a way and you're going to take a portion of other person's breath into your lungs and it's going to interchange but then just like let's blow it up let's think about the plants let's think about the algae in the room how they're going to take your breaths and then they're going to process it and give you oxygen back so there is another level of connection not just the audience but the plants as well and uh, i asked the audience can we now think with care about non-living environments as well i think what worked for the audience it was a, i don't know maybe the audience of 100 people would work for yeah. the audience that they kind of started to feel connected and if this mm -hmm. kind of this is just a simple exercise that you know it might be uh, seen like cheesy you know breeding and stuff like that but it's very important so mm -hmm. i think the audience started to relate to each other and maybe people who don't have 100 plants in their apartment <laughs> they kind of started to think and the more you think with care about uh, your immediate and non-immediate environment i think the better outcome there is in the long term I feel like it's very easy to not think about that very often because we are so much in our phones and everything is so fast paced and yeah. it's a very it's a very important exercise. Yeah, and you don't even think about breeding is the most important thing there is, right? And you don't even think about it because it's such a reflex. Right? Yeah. And then when you start to think about it, oh, then you are causing trouble. But the breathing is also wonderful because it's a, I call it a single non-disputable fact that mm. connects all humanity and non-humanity as well, because nobody's going to tell you breathing sucks, right? Mm. When you enter a room with a person who is really conflicted with you, that's a good first step in the resolution of any conflict because that person also wants to breathe, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you can't say like, ooh, like somebody, like an internet troll is going to write down like, oh, breathing sucks, I'm going to quit tomorrow. It's too left or right for me. <laughs> no way, dude, you like breathing. Everybody likes breathing. So that's yeah. a good starting point of anything, right? And then you can build the, you can build worlds on uh, that, right? And you can dismantle anything. So I, that's like, uh, that's what I'm researching now, like the power of breath through art. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds very simple, but things should be simple as well. Is that a part of your thesis as well? It is part of my thesis. Can you tell us about your thesis? <laughs> no. Come on, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I have people who can find me. <laughs> I like your people. Maybe we should go work for your people. <laughs> Whatever you can tell us about your thesis. Well, it's a, well. I already disclosed a lot of stuff, like the exploration of breeding methodology yeah. that is really new that started with breeding with as a modes of attunement to emotional and intuitive aspects of the world that we just don't perceive usually, but they're there. Mm. And then how to use art in a way that it attunes you to deeper sense of relationships and this interconnected webs of care uh, that we, they're here uh, present, but we are not really immersed into them. And that ended up me like uh, just figuring out this methodology of breeding with care, right? So you breed with care, you breed out art, breeds, you breed out, and then the piece of art breeds then. And then there's this interconnected relationship with you and the art and the nature. And the more and more, I actually signed, signed all my papers, like it's collaboration in between me and the algae culture, which I called the HAA1 collective, right? Yeah. Yeah, or high collective. <laughs> <laughs> There's this deeper sense of uh, collaborating ex, uh, that replaces exploitation, mm. uh, which is also a huge critique on the whole capitalism, neoliberalism, mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it, but just just hardcore extractionist uh, yes. po policy of like, let's just use everything, you know, yes. and abuse everything. So this is what I'm working on. I'm also, yeah, okay, so... Well, now you got me talk. <laughs> so I have this major solo exhibition at the Abozo Gallery that's going to take place somewhere in March 2025, right. which is next year. Mm -hmm. And I'm expanding my sculpture practice in conceptual photography and uh, algae block prints and all sorts of like, you know, this new stuff that came out of this methodology of uh, breeding uh, with care. So there's going to be a lot of stuff there besides the sculptures. And even sooner... Then about so is Nuit Blanche. Oh yeah, in wow. 2024 September. Yeah, 2024. Yes, I think September, October first, something like that. What are you excited about, and what can you tell us about what you're doing for Nuit Blanche? Oh Jesus Christ, I can't really tell you anything. <laughs> when is this going to be published? I've been banned from publishing anything about Nuit Blanche. 
before I don't know May thirty or something. Well, I could tell It'll you this. Be after is... that. Okay. It's just gonna be the third week of June. So. Okay. Cool. You're in the clear. Hi, we are in June now. <laughs> we are in June. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so throughout my explorations, I also started to work uh, with AI in a sort of way that I wanted to figure out the language of communication with algae microorganisms. If you asked me that ten years ago, I would say you're really insane, <laughs> crazy. That's not possible. How can you talk to this? But uh, the, as I've been growing algae for f four or five years now, there's some sort of consciousness there. There's some sort of logic. There's some sort of uh, intent to their behavior. It's not just, you know, really erratic. Mm. So I started to observe biochemical processes that are contained, uh, they're related to the exchange of gases like uh, CO2 and O2 how they form different shapes and how they're also reactive to light. So there is a language there which can be like figured out. So I, you know, I went into this rabbit hole of three months of research how to do things. <laughs> I, I wrote this whole book on AI languages uh, with, wow. <laughs> with algae microorganisms, very <laughs> speculative at the time. But the conclusion was that I could build an, uh, I could program an AI bot that could be like intermediate theory in between humans and algae microorganisms. It would not be a, a language based bot in a sense you would ask the question and then right. algae would answer in a really sexy voice. <laughs> yes, human master, that is so cool what you're proposing. No, they talk, algae talks in bubbles, right? There's those, mm -hmm. eff, I would call it the effervescence. Effervescence? Effervescence. The language of the effervescence or shortened like a Fezu language mm -hmm. or Fezu language of Hagnes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm trying to figure out how to, you know, make this uh, part of my New Blanche exhibition. So that's definitely going to be, I call it the uh, living algae cyborg. So it's going to be my sculpture, but spectators will be able to communicate with it. Wow. I still have to, you know, start working on it more deeply to know what is going to be happening there. But most probably you are going to be able to ask it a question and then it's going to answer in bubbles. Oh my goodness. And then the interaction between the audience and the algae is going to be really important because it's going to serve as a programming, collecting big data for actually maybe figuring out the language of the algae. Eventually, I just want to be able to ask them in real time, uh, to get an answer like yes and no, like, do you like this setting you are currently in? And then they could possibly ask, uh, answer yes and no. Maybe they can ask by shaping their bodies in a sort of way because they're really reactive to some sort of inputs. Plus, they're dependent on the carbon dioxide as well. So they want you to do so a lot of speculative wow. stuff. Wow. Go back to <laughs> what I said at the start. I trust in the process. I mm -hmm. have no idea <laughs> that this <laughs> might work or it might not work. But uh, one day I will be able to say, I, at least I tried, but I, I think it's possible. You know, we're living in times where everything is possible, right? This started from a seaweed salad. Yeah. <laughs> it's very tasty. Are there any hurdles that you face in sourcing sustainable materials for your art? Wow. Well, yeah, I'm trying to change that. Like as I developed my practice, my practice started with a lot of experiments that involved a lot of uh, plastics and then I replaced plastics with bioplastic and it's like all evolving process. Uh, I use uh, wood to for my plants, but in the future practice, I'm going to replace that. Uh, I'm thinking of using scalp shells, which I would source from restaurants around Toronto, then grind them into like some sort of paste and then build some structures or maybe even skeletal for the sculptures as well. So replacing this stuff with more sustainable materials, it's an ongoing process. So, I mean, it, it will probably never stop. Also, algae farms. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard for me to push the algae farms through. I wrote my first proposal three years ago. And then nobody wanted to give me money for that. It's like, what are you doing growing algae farm? What the, what, what the, what, what the p is that? Right. And then unfortunately last year happened and the forest fires happened and the whole thing happened and people were just like, Ooh, climate change is real. Oh my God. Right. Okay. So let's give you money. <laughs> you know, it was not the easiest. That I wrote a proposal <laughs> last year and then York uh, University decided to give me the Sustainability Innovation Award, which is basically support for building first non-commercial urban algae farm ever. So now I'm like, uh, have this like little budget to build an algae farm. 
and which is really great because I source my materials for sculptural building from the algae farm. Mm. So when I'm looking in, okay, let's talk some numbers. Let me try to, okay, whoa, 2.5 tons of carbon can be extracted from the atmosphere. At uh, this point of the development of the algae farm, uh, it has this great opportunity of exponential growth because algae grow really fast. So I could really expand and scale this up. So now I'm looking into finding spaces in the city or at the university where I could just expand that. So we're talking about gigatons of carbon that could be extracted. So there are real numbers here. This, yeah, is, yeah. Like, this is science. <laughs> <laughs> there are real numbers and real opportunities of what we could actually do. And then the best thing is that the current solutions of carbon capture don't really know what to do with the carbon that is captured. So they want to pump it below ground, which is like, oh, mm. yeah, sure. If you want to solve something, let's just pump it into ground. Like nothing bad can happen, right? Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> <laughs> and here we have like carbon captured carbon that is translated into art, right? So I'm basically building sculptures from pollution that is going to be captured that for at least, I don't know, 100 years. It preserved well, it could last even more. So the uh, my thesis work is actually going to be 25 foot tall sculpture that is going to be displayed as public art at York University. And it's going to be made out of like, I don't know, five tons of carbon pollution, right? So this carbon gets captured in art, yeah. right? And then you actually like this captured carbon. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful, captured carbon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So I started to think about carbon pollution in a different way. I'm thinking of it as a material that is for free and it's there mm. and I can use it in my sculptural practice, but also, you know, in algae farming practice. So I'm hoping that the next couple of years is going to be me expanding the the algae farming practice throughout institutions that I work with or maybe throughout the city. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, it's really necessary as well. I'm wondering about the longevity of your artworks. How do you ensure that they last? Do they last? How long do they last? Oh, that's <laughs> a really good question. <laughs> like my name, I mean... Next exhibition that I have is like a, an experimental laboratory where I figure out things. <laughs> so the first sculptures, they did not last a long time. Okay. How long did they last? I don't know, a couple of months. They would just start okay. to crack and crumble. And uh, then I tried to, and I started to figure out the techniques of preservation, of archiving. Now they would last like for a long, long time, right? So I'm using water-based resin. So as a new material to try to preserve it for the posteriority. Of course, there are like uh, uh, plausible discussions there because resin is not a natural material. Can you use resin as a natu non-natural mm -hmm. no, material where the natural material doesn't, doesn't that like kill your art practice? And then I'm just like, okay, there will always be uh, questions about how you do your practice and, you know, uh, as it's an experimental territory, there will always be some sort of like, you know, you could always say this thing is, sucks, <laughs> some sort of way. But it's a step towards me figuring out maybe uh, algae-based resins uh, and wow. stuff like that. So always like a, some stepping stones. So, uh, yeah. Also, when you think about it, it's better to have carbon captured with resin than carbon not captured with resin. So there's like a lot of pragmatism going on there when I think mm. about how will I work on stuff. So hopefully, you know, the, as I'm going more into public art and need to make them resilient, so hopefully they will be able to last forever and forever. Nowadays is like, what, five years? <laughs> <laughs> we have a new definition of forever. <laughs> yeah, we have a new definition of forever. Yeah. Oh, I haven't asked you. What even drew you to using algae for sculptures? I know it's seaweed salad, but what sparked that idea? Well, I think it was just an intuitive process of me not trying to think much about what I wanted to, but just working with the material of the this algae suicide biomass and then the material just presented itself in some sort of way first the uh, first uh, tests that i did with algae suicides were like two-dimensional flat like let's say almost print looking like mm -hmm. things right mm -hmm. and then uh, eventually i would just leave them out to dry and i didn't pay attention and some of them would just wrinkle in some sort of way they would create this small tiny three-dimensional objects that are like sculptural objects uh, which made me think, oh, wow, this is small and tiny, looks great. Can I build it bigger? <laughs> <laughs> How do you see the role of art 
in shaping a decarbonized future? Can I leave? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think there are a lot of artists that are already figuring this out that, mm -hmm. uh, that you know, decarbonized futures also mean a lot of other stuff. They mean like futures of climate justice and social justice. And there are a lot of, let's say, uh, for example, BIPOC artists that are working in uh, this as a futures of breath, the futures where they can breathe. And uh, I think art is going to play a major role. So we are shifting from uh, the role of artist. I think, in my opinion, it's changing. We are shifting from an artist that is just an artist to an interdisciplinary researcher. In such a way, I feel like it, as an interdisciplinary researcher, uh, I can do science, but mm -hmm. I look at the science from the artistic perspective, which means I'm not bound by formulas or dogmas or anything that hardcore mathematical, you know, it has to be this way. That's what science tells you. And art tells you, no, it doesn't have to be that way. And then you come to, again, to the trust in the process, right? If I uh, approach the LGC result from the scientific perspective, mm -hmm. I would probably not do much because I would be bound with this, like, this is not possible to yeah. do, right? So scientists, science is about proving stuff and then you have it let's say, as an evidence of what it's doing that you need to comply with. And art is about, like, we don't comply to anything. We mm -hmm. just do what we want to do. And that angle opens up new ways of thinking about science. And then uh, you apply interdisciplinary stuff to stuff that would not be connected. Let's say you apply psychology to growing algae, right? Or there's this whole sort of new knowledge that comes out of the connecting uh, disciplines that are usually would not be connected right so i think uh in that way the role of art it needs to change as well and then when it changes that more people are going to be doing interdisciplinary arts then more solutions about post carbon futures or carbon neutral futures are com going to come out because this is not just about every two or three months I figure out something that could uh, improve the solution for the climate crisis that comes out of the art practice. So art mm -hmm. practice is like an experimental laboratory where you create art, you have no boundaries where you're creating it, so you're not bound by anything, basically, mm -hmm. but just your own intuition and expression. And then every now and then there's this some sort of invention that it comes, oh, this material could capture carbon, which is like... I'm now working on algae bioconcrete thing, which could like uh, capture carbon from the air into a solid material that could be used for constructing stuff in the future, or I say growing stuff. So yeah, and these things just come out of nowhere, right? <laughs> so I think, uh, sorry to say to my fellow artists, but I think everybody's just going to need to work harder. <laughs> What long-term objectives do you have for blending sustainability into the broader art world? Well, definitely what I would like to do in the next couple of years is just, uh, let's say, make really huge sculptures, uh, let's say 50 feet that could capture gigatons of carbon and activate public spaces uh, too. So let's say that uh, you put one in every neighborhood mm. right, around the city and then put them around Canada and then put them around the globe. So it has functionality and it's also like an aesthetical piece, mm -hmm. right? So that would be uh, maybe where I'm going towards and then, you know, using algae farming as well as a side thing to incorporate into architecture, uh, public spaces as well. And well, let's see where that goes, right? How would you describe the vibe of the Canadian art scene, especially around bio art and ecological themes? Well, I really do not know. I'm trying to remember who else is working in the field of bio art, but there's like very, a very small amount of people who are actually doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, the other person that I know that's doing similar stuff is Neri Oxman. She was a professor at MIT. She worked with the bio stuff in different kind of way and then there's uh, I think ooh, uh, University of Windsor is it Windsor or something like that they have this bio art lab but that works with stuff but nobody's like really working into building huge sculptural pieces well I noticed a lot of people are starting to incorporate uh, some sort of biomaterials into their uh, work and mm. it almost seems like it's popular to incorporate plants mm. or dead plants as a uh, to you know extend the uh, uh, either painting or sculpture work into the space. But it's surely is something that has never been done before, which is scary and exciting at the same time. 
but eventually at the, when I finish my master's or PhD, whatever, I definitely want to do some, uh, you know, workshops or tutorials mm. or, uh, you know, maybe even teach bio art at the university level or similar. So, you know, to spread the knowledge throughout new generations and to anybody who wants to learn, uh, knowledge transfer is extremely important because then there's more people working on stuff that I work on. And there's mm -hmm. more possibility of uh, actually solving some principal issues that we are facing. So that's what I'm thinking for in the future. Yeah, but I'm also sure that there are people at a university level that are currently working on some things that might be similar with the bio art. With the, there's some all sorts of wonderful stuff that you could do with fungi or with the bacteria or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. What opportunities in Canada have really pushed your art forward? <laughs> I don't know. Possibility to biology sound <laughs> in the store during pandemic. Well, it's, well, so I, academia has always been good to me. And there was like a great network and platform because everywhere I would present or do my bio art, it was always welcomed as something that has a great potential. So uh, I think during my time at OKU, I got a lot of support from everybody. And when I transferred to your queue, I'm getting a lot of support there. So I would say that's a great platform for it to start. But academia would be number one. Second one would be definitely a Bose Gallery, which always, uh, you know, supported me even when I didn't have any artwork done. <laughs> right. So they've been supporting me for a couple of years now. So that's a, it's a great thing to find a gallery that does not treat you as a client, but more as, you know, let's say family. Mm -hmm. So these are two biggest opportunities that uh, that propelled my artwork. Otherwise, I don't know. I did a TED talk too. That was good. I, I remember I was really thirsty at the TED talk, and they didn't provide any, you know, bottles of water like yeah. you did. Mm -hmm. right? So I, I get, look after my guy. Yeah. So okay. so when you look at my <laughs> TEDx talk video, I was so thirsty that I'm doing this, <laughs> you know, every like five minutes, and and I'm like, oh my god, this. If you pay attention, it looks really creepy, you know. This guy talking about breath is going to save the world. I wonder, Give me some water, hopefully. I wonder if there's a meme floating around out there. Feel oh. free. Okay, so welcome to my podcast. I invite what? people who organize podcasts. Wait, are you like prank? Are you punking me right <laughs> No, now? no, dude. Okay, so, uh, well, I told you like uh, that I was working on uh, trying to figure out ways of communicating with the, with the algae. Yes. And uh, that I, then I kind of realized the humor is such an underappreciated uh, tool of, you know, propagating hope, right? And opening up spaces. And it's oh. like, as part of uh, some things that I was doing for my university, I did a podcast with the uh, two algae biocultures where I asked bio, uh, where I asked the algae to read a book, a very specific book, uh, Vibrant Ma Matter by uh, Jane Bennett, which talks about agency of non-living organisms, right? And uh, it was uh, it was kind of really funny because they mocked how a human mm, person, yeah. they mocked how a human person writes about the agency of the algae. And then again, algae uh, produce what? 70% of oxygen on a daily basis. And without algae, humans are going to be dead. So it's kind of a snobbish attitude in some sort of way when you look at it. And the point is decentering the human and trying to look at things from algae perspectives and what happens there mm. is that uh, algae don't have certain social contracts as we humans do they have no notions of uh, nationality no notions of territory right and then it's like the whole thing is like wow so we could be like this right? mm. and then well it, it was kind of speculative because i wrote the script that algae answered so algae algae they answer in bubbles but it was shot like it was a movie production, like shot, counter shot. So you got a notion that there is something there. <laughs> and then I put subtitles to their bubbles, right? And then in the end, it was really hilarious. The answers they provided, right? <laughs> and then they asked for some like audience questions. And then I had the, my Monstera plant answer. <laughs> and I had like this hilarious, you know, uh, immersion of non-living world into that as well. It was a really great experiment. I called it, call it the algae zero. You get it, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera. Oh my gosh. And it, it was supposed to be a podcast where Alji just talks shit about humans in a, some sort of, you know, really humoristic and funny way. But it's also a very safe space to discuss some progressive and anti-establishment ideas because when mm -hmm. Alji talk about 
uh, let's try to talk about any war from algae perspective it will be humans killed humans in a human city by using human weapons and then mm -hmm. other humans retaliated to kill the other humans in a human city by using human weapons right and then you're like oh this is just so absurd the yeah. whole conflict and the war and the, this uh, constructs algae are green okay they don't have there's no no algae are green they're queer and they're trans mm. okay so when you look at our world from their perspective they're like mm, what's the fuss guys about being queer what's about that right? right we don't understand that right and then you start to shave off all this artificial construct that are there just to divide us and you can mm -hmm. get into like really talking about discrimination mm -hmm. and you know all this sort of things, right? So I, I think I'm going to experiment with that more and then maybe bring it in a real studio setting as well. That I just have like, you know, in between two algae. Like, a conversation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there is like the pilot episode is there and I'm, I am I'm just want to ask algae to read something that is really human centric and mm -hmm. then just like... <laughs> Obliterate it. It just like obliterate it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, it's currently on Vimeo. You can find like okay. a, a very, very pilotish episodes shot in like my little algae space uh, at my mm -hmm. home. But I want to just like I said, I want to do it in maybe in a studio space and then just do maybe one season about algae talking about stuff. And it would be also great if I could have like some like writers, mm -hmm. right? That would collaborate on writing the show. Let's say if I had Jane Bennett come. Right. And then collaborate to what Alger got to say, like, you know, to yeah. evolve this as a playful, humoristic, very safe space where you can talk about things. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, nobody, you can't be judged back because basically these are Alger talking about stuff. Yeah, that's the, what, what I say, welcome to the Alger Zero podcast where it doesn't matter what matter. Because we Ooh. don't discriminate. <laughs> I think you found your tagline. <laughs> it can also be very inexpensive therapy. <laughs> it's a very, I'm, uh, now you kind of, now you see psychology. psychology yeah. Now you understand why I'm doing all of this <laughs> self therapy. Not a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, Vlad, where can our listeners find your work? Okay, you principally can find new stuff that I'm doing on my Instagram account, which is uh, V-L-A-D-D-K-A-N-I-C. And then, like, uh, you can find some stuff on my webpage. It's just Vladimir Kanich with a C dot com. But, uh, well, let's say mostly Instagram. And as for the exhibitions, the first one I'm going to have is going to be Nuit Blanche and September 4-1 Richmond Bose Gallery. And uh, that's it for now. I'm hoping to do more public art in the future. So I think I want you to look out of your window <laughs> and see a piece of my art. Thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. This was great. <laughs> see you on Al Jazeera. I'm going to invite you as a guest. <laughs> sure. Gosh, that'd be cool. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on Art Beat, where the stories of Canadian art come to life. Follow us on Instagram at Artbeat Podcast for exclusive content and previews of what's to come. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to stay updated with our journey through the world of Canadian art. Enjoyed the episode? Leave a review or recommend us to a fellow art enthusiast. Together, let's keep the conversation going and deepen our connection to the diverse world of Canadian art. See you next time.